Welcome to PhD with Woman on It, Hack the Future. My name is Beata Young and today's PhD Positivity Hack delivered will be by our guest Olivia Hardy Nail. Topic is how to create content that resonates with students. Episode 63 Recordings starts here. Let me remind you, this is a grassroots community that focuses on women on it, an inclusive forum of women in technology, startups, and female leaders and students who are supported by men as well. And I bring heart to that hustle because empathy is my mojo and empathy is critical when you are creating content that resonates with students. In today's episode, I want you to focus on how to create content that resonates with students. Think about how many times you've been scrolling through social media and seen something that made you stop and say, wow, I didn't know that. It could be an article, an email, or video, anything. The key is that it was interesting to you and it made you to want to read more or watch the whole video. And this is the kind of content that appeals. This is the content that will make you stop that video and rewind and watch it again. The student market is a desirable target market to create and share online content as it is one of the most dynamic, creative and lucrative markets in the world. One of the most appealing and engaging contents for students is helping them have a more, lot more success in classes by providing useful ways to keep their focus on studying and learning. Meet Olivia Hardy Neal, our guest for Positivity Hug Delivered, episode 64. She's passionate about creating accessible content for students to help them achieve their goals and find the fun in studying. She has worked in content creation and social media management, as well as various education-centered positions. Olivia is a third-year Bachelor of Laws and Arts students from New Zealand. She has a mostly female audience of 90% from, in order, US, UK, Philippines, Australia, and Canada. If you're a student seeking for tips and tricks that can help you get on top of your education game or digital content creative seeking inspiration to produce quality content for your audience, join us in a fun and informative session in this PhD episode. Liv, where in the world are you today? So I'm in New Zealand where I study at university. Um, so it's a bit late at night, but I'm really, really happy to be here. I'm happy to have you with us. I already asked you about your age because my daughter is 22. You're two young years younger and you already create captivating content. Well done. Can you tell us what is your platform? What is your website? How did you start? So basically, I just started by making content that I found inspiring to myself. So recording myself studying and making myself, you know, really want to get into it and do well in school. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. I started posting these videos. I thought, you know, it will keep me accountable if I start posting. And I was quite surprised because it turns out a lot of people want to watch that and want to be inspired by the same things that I am. So that was really cool, um, to see. So I kept, you know, posting on TikTok mostly. And as my audience grew, I moved over to Instagram. I'm still working on, you know, building Instagram as well. And I started making my own website where I started posting blogs and all of that sort of really, really fun um, and informative stuff on blog form so people can kind of come back to it or save it rather than having to watch it in a video. But mostly I use TikTok and make videos on there. So what kind of videos? Because uh, TikTok usually for us old guys, <laughs> It means you have to just do a little bit of dance moves and stuff. So what do you create? 
Well, I think I'd lose at least 100,000 followers if I tried dancing on TikTok. So we don't want to go there. <laughs> Basically, I just make videos of myself studying, um, which turned out it really inspires a lot of people and they really like to see that. So time lapses of my desk and kind of how I set it up, how I keep concentrating in the desk or on the desk, sorry. And yeah, there's that side. And then as well as that, there's the more informative side where I tell people the study hacks that really work for me, study hacks that they can try, you know, like maybe pretending you're a famous influencer for a day and having a day in the life like the famous influencer, or maybe setting a Pomodoro timer. So 25 minutes studying, five minute breaks, 25 minutes studying, five minute break to kind of keep your brain going. Hacks like that people really like. And I also do collaborations with brands. So I do promotions and things like that for products that I really think are great. So I've done work with Speechify, which reads your notes to you so you can learn them faster and take in more information as well as multitasking with them, as well as companies like Genie, which can, you know, help you research, you just type in your question and it finds a bunch of scholarly articles for you, which can speed up assignments, all of these really, really, really useful things. So that's, those are the three kind of sections of my content on TikTok. I love it. Uh, you've mentioned quite a lot of very useful things like Pomodoro technique, which is fascinating. And the first time I came across Pomodoro technique was when in 2017, I uh, mentored a startup team and they had exactly what you're talking about, the Pomodoro technique based uh, study uh, app, which was called uh, Study Ninja for all the things and there was a bit of gamification in it so uh, rather than have you know explanation of why you need pomodoro technique it had game uh, on it that would remind people about taking breaks or remind people about actually studying and <laughs> doing it effectively so uh, that's really really fascinating so um, before we go into more questions, what is your name? I mean, on all these, or what's the website? What's the, how, how you call it, Leaf? So my name on all of my sites is Tea and Study, which really kind of stemmed from the fact that I love to drink tea while I study. So it's pretty self-explanatory. But I also really think that the tea kind of aesthetic is really calming and it's good to not be super, super stressed. I think the whole energy drink culture is not really healthy for a lot of students, even though it's very popular. So I think if you can bring in relaxation and tea into studying, then I think that's the way to go. Well, I'm drinking my coffee, but I need coffee because it's 10 a.m. in the morning in Malta, in beautiful sunny Valletta. We are going to have a little bit of sun, so we had to do a recording because Leaf is on the other side of the uh, globe. So we had to tinker around to deliver this positivity hack uh, today. Uh, Leaf, so you've got Tea and Study uh, platform. You have... Uh, Instagram, you have TikTok. Uh, what are the other platforms you mentioned? So I have Instagram, TikTok, and then I have my website as well. And the website is quite new. Obviously, I'm not a developer or anything like that. So it was a lot of trial and error and a lot of times where I get messages from people saying, you know, why is your website gray or why is it flashing lights? And I have to say, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I've been mostly posting blogs on there for now. So I've done a few about motivation, a few about procrastination, and a few about useful tools for, you know, memorizing content and really remembering it for a long time rather than just learning it for an exam and then forgetting it, which is something I think that a lot of students do. So my website is mostly for blogs and things like that, whereas the social media sites are more for fun things, engaging things, videos, posts, pictures, those kind of things. Uh, excellent. Motivation, procrastination. Um, so website, how did you build your website? I, I know you may be not be able to explain exactly what you did, um, but maybe for somebody who wants to build a website, what would you be, be your number one advice? How to start with the website? 
Yeah, of course. So I think obviously a lot of there's a lot of tools out there. There's Wix and Weebly and WordPress and, you know, all of the website building tools. And I think it's good to start with that to see what you really like, what works, what format. I think I spent about a year trying to figure out whether I wanted a blog type website or a shop type website or anything like that. So I think playing around with the free versions of these self builders is definitely the way to go at the beginning. And I think once you know what you like, then you can go onto other websites and maybe get somebody to help you out, get a developer in to make sure it's all smoothed over. And once it's really smoothed over and you kind of know what you're doing and you have a website built, um, I prefer WordPress, but <laughs> that's just my opinion. Um, once you have that website built, you can kind of go into creating content and even monetizing your content. So finding people that really, really like it and keeping them as audience and maybe doing ads and things like that. So you can really turn it into a lifestyle or a career or something like that if you figure out how to build it from the very beginning. So definitely starting from very easy things like website builders that are online already, and then moving into maybe getting someone in or paying a little bit of money to have exactly what you know you want. Beautiful. So uh, are you at the stage of monetizing? You're earning some money from uh, your website, from your content? Only a small bit from my website. As I said, you know, it's a bit difficult to know exactly what you're doing on the website, but ads and things are something that anybody can do on any website. So definitely ads brings in uh, not very much, but a little bit. Mostly uh, I earn money from my content through TikTok and brand collaborations and things like that. So I have to really, really like a product in order to accept a brand collaboration. I have to really think it's useful. And if I think that it's really going to help students and they're really going to enjoy it, then of course I will collaborate with a brand and ensure that their product gets put out to the audience that will find it really, really useful and who might really enjoy it and benefit from it. So tea and study and, and you leave, you're the influencer of stud, students um, world. Uh, but how as an influencer, how you not uh, how, how you are able to say no to big corporations who want to basically suck up your your content and <laughs> and make sure that they get the best uh, out of you. Um, so how do you make sure you're not being exploited? Well, I think that's a really hard one. And I think women especially find it really difficult to say no to big companies, you know, I mean, big companies for one, but at work and taking on tasks that they don't want to take on maybe, or taking on extra work that they don't really have time for. I think that that's a really common thing for women to do. So building this kind of confidence is one thing that I've been working on and it is hard, as you say, you know, it's hard to stand up to the big companies, especially if you're being offered a lot of money to do a promotion. It's, it can be really hard and a little bit scary, you know, you don't want them to blacklist you and you have to be really careful with your reputation as an influencer. But I think the main takeaway I would say for building confidence and being able to say no to big scary brands is definitely you know, practicing in smaller situations. And I think that goes for anything you're trying to do. So, you know, in your life, if you're too busy, you know, practicing saying no to small things, like maybe your friends want to go out, but you're too busy to go out or you're doing work or you're working on your passion project, your website, whatever, you know, saying no in these circumstances. And you can kind of build the confidence to say no to the big companies after a while. And I think also if you make a mistake, or you accept something knowing that you can go back, you know, don't be afraid to say, actually, you know, I don't think this is going to work. And knowing that you are offering a lot, they really want to work with you. And they're not going to react negatively or anything like that. You have the power in the situation and remembering that all the time can really help with being able to stand up to things that you might not want to take on. Beautiful. So, <clears throat> uh, Liv, you're at as uh, of now, I mean, end of May uh, 2022. How many followers do you have on TikTok? At the moment, I have around 220,000 followers, which I think is absolutely crazy. If you imagine that many people in a stadium or a room, you know, it just becomes overwhelming how many people have clicked the follow button on your account and watch your content. Like, it's very crazy. And I mean, some of like my videos have over eight or nine million views. I just can't even 
conceptualize that many people. So it's really crazy and very rewarding to me that I've been able to grow this community to that size. And uh, do people reach out to you and send you messages and communicate with you? Yeah, of course, all the time. I mean, obviously through comments, I get hundreds of comments every day. It's impossible to even see them all uh, from students and pre-students. So maybe people that are thinking of going into university, don't know what they're studying. I get hundreds of comments every day asking, you know, do you have any tips or interacting with the other people that are commenting on the page, you know, asking them, oh, you study criminology. What's that like? What do I need to do to get into that? And it's incredibly rewarding to see that kind of engagement going on in a community that you've built for others. It's really, really amazing. Um, as well as that, obviously, I get uh, DMs and private messages all the time from students who are asking for my favorite <laughs> study hack or the, the best way I think that they can decide on a degree to study or anything like that. You know, it's all sorts of advice that they're asking. And some of the things I'm qualified and happy to provide advice on, but a lot of the time I direct them to other people who I think might be a little bit better or websites they can use or tools they can use, apps they can download, things that can help them on that. And it's really, really wonderful for me to be able to do that and be able to help these people. So um, I, uh... I presume it's very it's sometimes uh, quite overwhelming to be swamped with all these messages. How do you keep sanity? Sanity? Well, I wouldn't say that I keep sanity, <laughs> but the way I make sure that I'm, you know, staying on top of things and still enjoying the things, the comments and the content that I'm making and everything like that. Definitely time management, which is a skill that I think people work on for their entire lives. And I certainly have not mastered um, that one. So I think time management is really important because you can divide your time into small chunks. So let's say I have 100 comments or 200 comments to reply to. I probably... I'm not going to get to all of them. So what I'll do is I'll set aside one or two hours, the amount of time I have available. If I have other things on, of course, I'm not going to set aside as much time, but just doing as much as I can in that time and really being involved and engaged in that time. And as soon as that time is up and I've you know done enough that I feel happy with it, then I can go on and do something else and not feel overwhelmed, you know, thinking, oh, I have to check on my comments, I have to check on my Instagram notifications, I have to check on my messages. Once I've done the amount of engaging that I am able to do that I know I can do well, when I can really be engaged and give proper answers to the people that I'm chatting with, then I move on and do something else. And I think having this separation is really important, whether you're a student, you know, trying to do assignments and work and go to class and all of these things, or whether you're a content creator trying to move forward and build a community like this. So um, apart from that, you've got times when you have lots of exams. Do you still post uh, things or do you do you treat it like, a, you know, leisure time or Pomodoro technique as you will as, as, as a break? Uh, from the mundane uh, task of studying? Yeah, so I think the way that I'm able to keep making content all the time and also take breaks if I need to is knowing kind of when these time periods are coming up. So this again links back to time management. I think that it's important to know when you're going to have exams, you can create content in advance. But luckily kind of <laughs> with my niche and my content that I create, it's quite easy to be able to make content during exams because students want to see what it's like in your life when you're in this horrible, stressed out period of time. So I can film, you know, today I woke up, I went to the library, I did this and that. There's all sorts of things that actually create content during these horrible, <laughs> busy times, as stressful as it is for me. So I can film myself studying or film what I do in the day, film, you know, the not so nice times when I'm not doing so well. And people really relate to that and they really enjoy seeing that. And I guess where it gets hard is having to put all of this content together and edit it and think of a fun caption and also keep engaging during this time. So again, the same way time management, knowing exactly when you are able to engage. And if you're not, you know, letting your followers and community know that and they'll understand, you know, they're students as well. And 
they know that things get busy and if you engage with them, you come off more organic and more real. So I think it's really important that you have this engagement with the, uh, mm. with the community in this way. Yeah. So we have a question from Patrick who's asking, uh, Liv, you are an active member of your university uh, debating society. Does that help you with the ability to communicate and formulate messages on TikTok at all? Absolutely. I mean, that's a wonderful question. And yeah, I am an active member of the debating society. I really love debating and I've been on the executive of society for a year and a half now. Um, so yeah, it absolutely does help. And I think communication overall is so important, whether you're a content creator or a student or an entrepreneur, anything like that, communication is key. And that's definitely why I enjoy doing things like law, where the essence of it is you have to get your point across well, succinctly, and with the right information. And it's the same with debating. It really, really helps you be able to get your points across very succinctly, very quickly, to think on your feet. So I definitely think that the debating skills help with communication. And overall, communication is really important for being able to email people well or DM people back on Instagram succinctly so they know what you're saying and they don't go, what? What do you mean by that? Um, so definitely, I think that being able to formulate ideas is a skill that you learn in debating that you can use a lot on TikTok and things like that. Even with script writing, when I have a brand collaboration or when I have a study hack that I want to give to my followers, and my community on TikTok, I think that the quick thinking and the ability to succinctly have your thoughts out into the world um, is definitely a skill that you learn from debating and is so important when it comes to social media and TikTok and all of that. I think uh, overall in career, you need to be able to formulate your thoughts and uh, especially when you go to the interview, uh, this is the only way it make or break a uh, moment uh, when you can make a good conversation, good impression. And uh, we talked about it uh, off screen uh, about the fact that you may not be able to give our female followers advice on career, but on the other hand, you've done some things that are impressive. And I have to applaud you for one thing is starting because so many of us have this idea in mind and they dwell on it, but they never start. How did you start? Well, honestly, it was a little bit of an accident the way I came into the whole content creation, making content for students thing. Um, I started by just making content of myself. And when I realized that people really enjoyed it, were really liking it, I kept making it. And when they would ask questions, I would answer it and I would make a video out of it, which is really, really, I think, a cool way to begin because you're not only being able to make your own kind of content, but you're able to help others at the same time that you're growing your own page and your own brand. So the way, the most important thing I think for starting is creativity, because when you're starting out and you have no experience doing anything like what you're doing now, it's important to be able to think outside the box and do things that other people maybe have never seen before, or that's kind of new in the TikTok area. So when I joined TikTok as well, it was also tons of dancing videos, funny prank videos, animal videos, but I didn't really see a lot of study content creators until I grew and kind of cultivated my algorithm, my community to be that in that education, education sphere. So a lot of the beginning things was you know, how can I turn a study hack into something interesting that people will actually watch? And whether that was using catchy music or bright flashing text or other things, you know, like that, kind of how I was organizing my room. Look how beautiful this is. And also here's an amazing study hack that you can use. Kind of got people thinking, oh, maybe I am interested in this. Maybe I do want to, you know, know this. Maybe I do want to follow this account. Maybe I want to join this community. So just growing and finding ways to engage organically and creatively is definitely the way that I think starting from the beginning with no experience got me to where I am now with, you know, 220,000 followers, which again is so crazy to me. 
It is totally crazy. I'm I'm reaching one ta- one uh, thousand followers on Instagram, and I'm just like begging, oh, when is this moment going to come? Because you know it's it's a hard work, and uh, really, uh, but then the really good skill is having this community of supporting members who are sending me uh, messages or to our team messages uh, saying you know i enjoyed this or your story is so lovely and uh, this is amazing where are you and so on so these are the, the moments of joy when i know that it resonates that you know these unique moments of oh this content is actually resonating with someone and I changed somebody's life and somebody said, yes, I really needed to hear that from you. Thank you so much. Right. Um, what is the optimal time for your TikTok videos? Optimal That's another time. question. Optimal time. Optimal time. Um, I, I think it's, it's about the length of the video. The length. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> um, so I think definitely the shorter the better when it comes to TikTok, especially. I think that if you can catch people's attention at the very beginning, then you can make a longer video. If you're putting out study tips or things that traditionally people wouldn't find super interesting and super engaging, especially if they're on TikTok, which means they're probably not doing work or not in the mood to be doing work. So definitely think that you have to keep it short and really, really extremely engaging. So I think that maybe seven seconds is good for starting. If you're doing one tip or something like that with some nice music in the background, seven seven seconds is really good. Otherwise, 10 to 30 seconds for something longer. Like here's an amazing website I found. Here's an amazing app that I use. Here is my favorite study tip for when you really don't want to get up in the morning and go to the library or here is the best place I think is good for studying. Those kind of videos can be uh, maybe 10 seconds to 30 seconds. And then for other things that kind of fall really under a niche and is going to, you know, is going to a community that is going to appreciate it can be a little bit longer, a little bit slower. So my study time lapses, for instance, they, I think they range from about seven seconds to one minute. My first video that went viral was one whole minute long, which seems crazy now because the trend is to make very short, quick videos. But back then when I started, it was these long videos where people ended up you know, really wanting that content. And that's when you know people are wanting the content is when you can do longer videos that people kind of discovered as time has gone on. That's uh, your discovery. Uh, That's how long it took you because you started uh, how many years ago? How many months ago? Trying to figure. Over a year ago, I think I started in about July of 20. 20. So it was during the lockdown, during the really difficult time when I was going through my first ever university end of year exams, my first ever law exams. And that was when, you know, I started posting. So yeah, back then, if I was just making videos that I, I thought were interesting and good, and some of them did really badly, some of them did really well. But as time has gone on, I figured out, you know, the optimal time for different types of videos. And it definitely does change a lot more than you might expect. So uh, in terms of your content creation, do you have plan of what you're going to post in the next month? Or is it just impromptu? I mean, it really depends on the month and how much I have going on on the outside kind of in my life other than content creation and other than TikTok. So if I really have time, if it's the holidays and I'm not really doing a lot of work outside, not working um, and not going to uni, not having classes and not having exams, then I can really make a plan. And that's usually when I focus on Instagram. So if you follow me on Instagram or if you've ever seen the way I post, it's always in chunks of just a few months. So during the holidays when I have time and I can plan months of content and photograph everything and put them all out, that's when I really can plan things. And on TikTok, it's a little bit harder because the trends are so incredibly fast. You know, you'll see a video and you'll save the sound and two weeks later, nobody will be using it. It can't go viral because, you know, it's not popular anymore. So on TikTok, it's a little mix of both. 
I think planning content is good because you don't want to have too many app recommendations or too many ads or too many time lapses because people will find that a little bit repetitive, a little bit monotonous, and a little bit boring after a while. Of course, I'm sure like very interesting videos, but if people aren't getting variation, they're not super engaged. So there's a little bit of all of that kind of content you really want to mix in well. And on the other side, you also want to be able to spontaneously make trends. And this can be really hard, especially I think for women because we're expected to put on makeup and get all dressed up. If you're not looking amazing, you're probably, it feels like you're not gonna get as many views. But I think with TikTok, the amazing thing is people don't care about that, that stuff. On YouTube, everyone's always perfectly cultivated, but on TikTok, you can record a video in your bed of you just waking up and thinking of something, and it can get millions of views, millions of likes. So that's what's really great about being able to use TikTok as the main platform. You can film your content as soon as the trends come out and nobody's really going to be commenting on the way you look or the way you dress. I mean, of course, there are trolls and people that aren't feeling good in their own lives and are taking it out on social media. But mostly the community is super positive and makes it super easy for a spontaneous posting that can be used within a kind of scheduled posting time as well. So uh, have you got your channel on YouTube as well? Um, I did start a YouTube channel, but it was a little bit scary at first because, you know, everyone on YouTube looks so perfect. All of the videos are amazing. And I think there's a lot of embarrassment that comes from starting a YouTube channel, putting your face out there, putting yourself out there without many followers. But that's definitely something that's on the cards. It was on the cards for the beginning of the year. But I think as time goes on, um, I got extremely busy with uni, so it's probably on the cards for these upcoming holidays, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, I think it's you... very exciting. We will yes. be following you, Liv. <laughs> As for well, we have got our channel, and you will probably some of our viewers are watching us on YouTube. We will be excited to see you live on YouTube because also one thing that we noticed uh, while traveling is um, everybody, every hotel has got option of watching uh, YouTube. Uh, uh, in the hotel room so yeah. um you think you're not perfection i mean like look at you you look <laughs> perfect you look beautiful what's wrong i mean like what else do you think we should be doing to, to look like you <laughs> I mean, of course, with YouTube especially, because there's so many professionals on there, it's always the amazing lighting sets, and they have LED backgrounds, and, and some people even have an entire room dedicated to just content creation, which I think isn't incredibly attainable as a student, you know, when you're living at home or living in the halls. So I think that that kind of stuff is very, you know, sought after. But Honestly, I think as time goes on, I think that what audiences are really wanting is, you know, being down to earth, being original and being real on social media. So obviously there's new things coming out like be real where there's no filters or anything. And that's kind of the style that audiences are moving towards. So people on YouTube don't have to have these amazing professional lighting kits and, you know, perfectly cultivated hair and makeup all the time, you know, I think it's not as much of a necessity as it was when YouTube was really, really, really getting popular in its peak. And there were all of these incredibly professional creators earning millions of dollars. I think that we're really moving away from that style of mm, style of content. Pleasing everyone. So one, yeah. one thing I, I want to go back to, because just last week we had a conversation with a uh, uh, lovely uh, lady from France. She was talking about um, humor and leadership. And she said something that resonates, I think, is very ac accurate to this show, which is you cannot be a jar of Nutella. You cannot please everyone. So... Just do it. Uh, that's another mantra from startup. Uh, I would say that is better than perfect. So don't yeah. try for perfection. Just yeah. just do it, Ali. We will be following you. So you have uh, one follower more. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I really, yeah, I really agree. I think that, you know, uh, being able to, you know, not 
not strive for perfection all the time because especially for women and stuff we're socialized you want to please absolutely everyone and come across as nice and you don't want to be made fun of so it can be there can be a lot of shame around creating social media content on TikTok or YouTube or Instagram when you're putting your face out there putting your life out there I think honestly just really really go for it that's the way social media is moving there's less criticism out there nowadays at least from my experience and I really think that anybody who wants to should really just go for it I think there is a very, very uh, important trend as well going on because Ablv just uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago announced that they will not cooperate with influencers who are using excessive uh, filters. Mm. And whether it's picture or whether it's video content, they want us to look real because this is having an impact on overall mental uh, health issues because especially young people, young uh, kids, uh, they see this perfection uh, everywhere and they look at themselves in the mirror. And when we are young, when we are growing up, uh, we tend to criticize, over criticize ourselves. And women, as you said, are um, going through the gaze of you have to have perfect body, perfect face, perfect everything. And this is not how reality looks. Not mm. everything is perfect. Liv, we have some amazing questions from Natalie, who is a big fan of yours. Liv, do you also create content on Instagram Reels? And if so, how is it different sharing on TikTok versus Reels? There's definitely a difference between TikTok and Instagram Reels. I think that Instagram is definitely moving towards trying to be more like TikTok, but the trends are a little bit later, a little bit different. The length is a little bit different, you know, uh, for the optimal view time, the optimal engagement. Um, and Instagram Reels is something that even I haven't even really hacked yet. And I think there's a lot of variation, a lot of creators on Instagram say the exact same thing. A few of their reels get millions of views and the rest get like less than even five views, which seems like a huge variation, but it is a really common trend. Um, I haven't done a lot of Instagram reel posting with my own content, but I definitely will say people love to share more on Instagram than more on TikTok. So I will find my Instagram reels everywhere <laughs> on Instagram once I posted it, not on my page. So people really like to, you know, download it, tag me and post it on their channel a lot more than I see on um, really happening on TikTok. And I think that's wonderful. If as long as you bypass, you know, the bit about copyright and you're not stealing other people's content, I think that having a community that likes your content so much that they want to put it out there on their own page and show other people, I think that that's really amazing. And that's something that Instagram Reels um, has a little bit more than TikTok. Um, but the most experience I have with Instagram Reels is with working with companies. So making content for them, not as TM study, but as a social media manager. So I really think that with that is where I see the trends coming in about two weeks later. So it's always quite funny when something was trending on TikTok. And I saw it there and it kind of faded out. It's not so common anymore. And then boom, it pops up on Instagram Reels. So I think keeping up on TikTok is definitely key to doing well on Instagram Reels too. So it's uh, quite an amazing uh, time management uh, because if you uh, look at Liv's uh, day, um, it's studying, it's creating content for her own a brand but also for some other brands tell us about your career yeah so i've worked for i think maybe six companies now creating content on instagram a little bit on tiktok but surprisingly not so much on tiktok um, and Facebook, LinkedIn, that kind of stuff as well. And it's really interesting how different social media platforms can have such different audiences, such different user bases, but still have the same underlying principles to how to grow on them, how to do well. So I've worked for a nonprofit, I've worked for an education company, I've worked for a recruitment company, and a few others as well, making this content that's um, very specific to their niches and growing their social media with it. So I think definitely the main takeaway I've had from doing that kind of thing for a few years now is 
that you have to make content that's appealing to your audience. And this might seem super intuitive, but honestly, I think a lot of people do struggle with it, including me, especially at the beginning when I only had this TikTok experience with the student community. And then suddenly I'm working with a business community, but making content, you know, that's going to appeal to them, that they're going to want to read, that they're going to want to see, you know, what emojis are you using? Are you using old trends or old memes or brand new things that maybe they won't quite understand yet? And also incorporating this old stuff into the new. And from doing that for other companies, I've learned a lot about my own page. And as you can kind of see, if you're looking through my TikTok, the style does change a lot as it goes through. And as I kind of worked with other companies, seeing what they were doing, at the same time, I was growing my own page with what I'm doing with students and everything like that. So you've been working with education and nonprofit. These are quite, uh, I mean, you, you said the number um, of companies, you had six companies and they were like broad. They were not necessarily all in education. How no. do you find yourself? Like find... <laughs> That's a really in a good new environment in in a new kind of concept. Okay, now I have to create content for LinkedIn. I've never created a TN study for LinkedIn. How <laughs> do you work around that? Yeah, of course. So I think definitely taking your own experience and what you've been able to create on your page is just absolutely the baseline, totally the key to being able to move into different companies and work for different you know, niches like that. So taking content that I've made for students, which is really engaging, which is really fun because it's for young people. You know, I'm posting how often, I'm posting how long, taking that information and thinking, well, how can I apply this to a different niche or a different industry is really, really key. So, you know, if older people maybe want to watch up to a minute long or three minutes long, um, I know I show some of my content to my parents and they go, whoa, that's that's too fast. I can't read that. So I think, hmm, OK, maybe next time I'll make a really you know slow video or something with less transitions and less effects, less lighting things. Um, and, they, you know, I show it again to my parents or to my boss and they say, you know, wow, this is really engaging. So even though it's not maybe not working for my niche, for my young audience, for students, it can definitely work for, you know, adults, uh, or business people, people on LinkedIn, people on Facebook, maybe an older demographic. So, yeah, applying information and experience that you have in your own life brand niche so my teen study things to other companies is definitely the way that you're able to bring that experience along and really bring a lot to the table when you get jobs like that or when you're doing things like social media management maybe for something that you haven't really done before another question from patrick how different are trends in new zealand and the antipodes compared to the rest of the world for social media there's definitely a very noticeable difference. So when I'm on my private TikTok, you know, just my own page, it's full of New Zealand trends with the New Zealand accent and things that are familiar, the countdown supermarkets, the four square supermarkets, all of that kind of thing. And I get, funnily enough, I do get a lot of content from Australia when I'm on my New Zealand um, you know, personal account. And all of the, these things are quite different. You know, it's using New Zealand music, it's using New Zealand effects, it's using New Zealand language. So words that, you know, Americans have no idea what we're talking about, or Australian as well, you know, calling sandals thongs. Americans would scream at that, where <laughs> Australians are thinking, oh yeah, that's normal. So definitely, um, I think there's a huge difference there. And because a lot of my audience, well, the majority is from the US and the UK and Canada, I have to really feel this divide. I can't be using you know, New Zealand lingo, as, as you might say, for an American audience because they kind of won't really get it. Um, so yeah, I think noticing what's working in New Zealand, you know, what kind of the community is doing versus what's going on in the US and the kind of content I'm seeing coming out of there, really working on finding a balance there. Because of course I live in New Zealand and I do get a few people from my university or my city commenting, you know, oh, I went there yesterday, which is really, really cool. So being able to cater to that is really important, but also wanting to, 
appeal to this wider audience, this wider community, and make sure that they're also feeling like they can relate to your life and they can be in your life without being in the same country as you or even the same city and university, I think is really important. So there's definitely a balance to be found between the New Zealand trends and the rest of the world, the US, Canada trends. You're wearing many hats of English speaking <laughs> countries. Um, now, another question from Patrick. This is an elaborate one. Did the very rigorous lockdown in New Zealand drive more creativity on social media compared to other regions which were not so doctrinate in closing down for long spells? Yes, I mean, anyone who was watching the news or saw what was happening in New Zealand will know that we had some incredibly long, very, very strict lockdowns. So there were times that the only thing that was open is the supermarket and the pharmacy and, you know, the emergency services. And that was it. We, we could not go anywhere. We couldn't do anything. Schools were not open. Universities were not open. It was so incredibly strict and this was for months at a time. So not just a few weeks, um, it went on for a very, very long time. So I had my first experiences of exams and things like that all online, all in my room, which is kind of where the studying grew because I couldn't go to the library. I couldn't go study with my friends. I just had to sit in my room and do it. So finding this community of other people on TikTok was absolutely amazing and very, very helpful for that kind of <laughs> that kind of thing. So I definitely think that being able to, uh, I won't say the privilege of being able to stay at home, but having this experience of being stuck at home, not really doing anything, absolutely, not just me, but in, in inspired a lot of people to get on social media, start making TikTok videos, and whether they're dancing, you know, or making study content, it's really, really really the the same for everything you know being stuck at home really makes you <laughs> a bit crazy bored out of your mind to be honest so of course it's going to come with you know how can I let out my energy how can I let out my passions if I can't sell my products at a convention and I can't go in person to stores how can I make content that people are going to love on TikTok you know how can I find a community that I no longer have on the out in the outside world online and i think everybody started finding create creative ways to let out that passion and energy and i think social media was a great way to do it because of this community that's available for people on there uh leaf you talk beautifully about uh, the excitement and the you know taking the negative of of being in the lockdown into something positive did you struggle mentally with the fact that you couldn't meet with people? You couldn't uh, have uh, social interactions like, uh, you know, a couple of months before? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's, uh, I'd be hard pressed to find somebody who didn't struggle with mental health problems or with, you know, thoughts of maybe depression or sadness, anxiety. I think everybody experienced a lot of difficulty during this time. And I'm definitely uh, like part of that group, you know, it can be so isolating and so difficult to be stuck at home with nobody around, you know, for months at a time. I think that that would take a toll on anybody. Um, so definitely I struggle with that. But I think coming out of that was so much innovation. So because of this lockdown period, you know, people were using Zoom and people were using, I think there was an app called House Party going around and people were using Messenger all the time. And all of these kind of chatting channels, things like that just increased in popularity so much, which allowed people to, I mean, I wouldn't say interact, but at least be able to see others face to face and chat and see people's reactions, you know, all of that really amazing stuff that was going on. So I think that without that innovation, it would have just been so incredibly difficult, um, even more so than it was. But I think with all of that, it made it a little bit easier, a little bit better. You could see other people who were going through the same thing as you, you know, being stuck inside, having nowhere to go, having nothing to do, you know, being afraid as well, because we didn't really know what was going on at the time. So having this amazing stuff was, yeah, really, really very very helpful for keeping sanity during the lockdowns but yeah. absolutely it's it's like a, a kind of a 
the world was uh, upside down and you had to do something about it. So well done uh, for uh, being still positive and still creating that content. Patrick mentions, uh, you mentioned a broad tail across the Anglosphere for viewers. Now you are better able to travel. Will you see, will we see Leaf Go Global on social media? Well, I'm definitely planning a trip to China soon. So I'm hopefully I'll be able to do an exchange in Beijing and help my you know Chinese skills, learn a new language, maybe improve on that. And if I'm able to go, if the borders open up everywhere, then I will absolutely be going to other places, maybe doing university exchanges and showing my experiences on all of that sort of thing. So how do I learn a new language in another country? How do I go to university in another country? What's it like traveling to other countries from somewhere where you've you know, never been there before when you've lived in the same place your whole life? So there would definitely be times where I'm planning on going overseas and hopefully finding an audience there as well. If you, you know, creators who can speak multiple languages can find it really, really, um, helpful for their growth when they can engage with all of these different audiences from different places. So uh, there's going to be lots of tea. Uh, is that the only reason why you chose China? Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, the tea will be amazing, I am sure. Um, but my boyfriend's also Chinese, so I spend a lot of time with his parents. And I also have a Chinese teacher who helps me a lot all the time. Um, with you know, learning things, learning about how to talk about students, how to talk about studying in Chinese. So I'm really, really looking forward to going over there and you know, experiencing all the amazing things that she tells me about in real life. So that's definitely a goal. Um, my favorite. Uh, I see lots of comments coming through about going. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic Chinese teacher or teacher, mm -hmm. sorry, but fun. Oh, anyway, uh, let's move on to uh, a question I wanted to ask you because a couple of um, months ago we had Professor Gunnar, we had also uh, Dr. Karin uh, who was talking about uh, being in education, and there was there are so many educators talking about how to motivate students. What would be your number one advice to all these educators, how to motivate you and your peers? What would be your number one advice to them? I absolutely think that passion rubs off a hundred percent. I have taken so many different papers in my, you know, three years of university and five years of high school, so many different subjects. And the ones that I've moved forward with, the ones that I've loved the most, are the ones when I can tell my teachers and professors, professors are really passionate. So obviously my English degree, I had the most amazing, the most amazing uh, English teacher in the world in high school. She was, you know, absolutely wonderful, incredibly passionate, loved reading, writing, all of that type of stuff. And, you know, I could just feel that and it was so amazing. And, you know, I started studying it in university and it was the same with classical studies. You know, I also study classics and ancient history and that's entirely because of this amazing teacher that I had in high school. And that's the same with a university. I would have never thought that I would study anything to do with ancient Egypt ever. But when I had this amazing professor who was so passionate and you could just tell how much she loved the stuff she was teaching, I wanted to move forward. I wanted to show her that I could do well in her class. I wanted to show her that I would study for her content and could share her passion. So 100%, if you can show that you're passionate about something, that you love the paper you're teaching, that you love the content you're putting out there, then absolutely that is what will help students be motivated and really want to study more. Passion is contagious. Uh, that's uh, one uh, number one lesson from LEAF to uh, educators all over the world. Uh, would you say um, uh, that you are uh, grateful to your teacher, the literature teacher, or is there somebody else that you're uh, grateful towards achieving the success uh, without somebody that you couldn't be where you are? Absolutely. I think my definitely my teachers in high school who I could just 
tell loved their subjects are really what pushed me to want to do well which is what made me want to you know start the making study content on TikTok it was because I wanted to do well in these exams so I put this content out there and it turns out lots of other people do too so definitely my amazing so, teachers so who's the number one person that you feel that you achieved a better success thanks to them uh, I would probably say my English teacher from high school, Miss Ali. She was just insanely passionate all the time. She made me start reading again. She would make me start studying again. She made me want to do better. She made me want to achieve more. And she also made me not afraid to put my content, you know, out there because you could tell how passionate she was about her subjects and the things that she was teaching the articles she was showing us the books that we were reading and studying and because you could tell all of that you also wanted to be passionate about that and you know seeing someone else be so passionate is what leads you to want to find your own passions so whether or not you want to do the subject that your teacher is telling you about in school or whether you want to do something completely different i think you want to find this love and passion that you want to put out there and that's what i found in my study content that's what I found in my TikTok. You know, I have this passion for creating content and creating study content, especially because I know that I'm helping people and I really love that. And I think definitely seeing her love what she's doing and love showing people what she's doing um, was also the most helpful for me. All the best greetings to this passionate teacher and um, we hope she is uh, achieving great success with uh, other students uh, just like Liv. I'm sure she's uh, really proud of you. What would you say is your number one book that uh, you wish you read before you started your content or your career? I think, I mean, this completely ties into the whole passion thing that I was talking about before, but I'm, I, I actually ended up reading this before which is kind of what propelled me but i think that if i read it now i absolutely would have wished i read it earlier which is reading like a writer by francine prose and whether or not you love english writing reading that kind of thing it's just infectious how much she knows about what she's writing how much she loves about what she's writing and how passionate she is about the content she's putting out there it's just so so inspiring. Um, I think that also at the time that I read it, I hadn't really read and enjoyed a book. And even the book itself, I didn't really read and enjoy. But the amount that I could feel her passion, how much she loved, you know, this thing that I also loved, which happened to be reading was just so inspiring um, for myself. You know, I started reading, eventually focused on school, and then started my study account, which was the beginning of my social media career and all of the amazing, fun things that I've done since. So I think that if I can convey a passion for something as much as she did, then I will be very pleased. <laughs> Bravo! We are running out of time. I need to ask you a question, which is, what is your life lesson quote? How did it impact you? My life lesson quote. I think I sent this through. I didn't save it, but it was from the same book as the Francine Prose one, which was basically about not being afraid, uh, not being worried about creating this content or creating what you really love and, um, you know, wanting to experience things. So, you know, I think it was something about if you want to grow roses, you would visit rose gardens to see them the way that a rose gardener would or something along the lines of that. You know, if you want to do social media, go to visit. Oh, the quote's there. That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, go yes, to see absolutely streamers and go to see you know people that really love what they're doing if you want to do something like teaching go watch passionate teachers go experience that and try to see them the way you know the other teachers would so you can put yourself in anyone's shoes and get amazing experience from anybody imagine the pandemic is over and you can invite any person in the world anywhere in the world who would you invite and where would you go to? Um, where would I go to? Honestly, I'd probably go to wherever her favorite place was, but they asked me this question at my middle school interview um, and I answered Taylor Swift, so I'm going to stick by that. <laughs>
<laughs> my 12 year old self um, because she gave so much and now because she gave so much wisdom. So she talked about owning situations, not being afraid to be yourself, not being afraid to put yourself out there and taking the criticism and letting it slide right off your back, which I think is so important, especially if you're getting into social media, putting yourself out there or really anything. And where would you go to with Taylor? Where would I go to? I take her straight to my university and say, what can you help me with? <laughs> Bravo. Education is the passport for the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. This is your time to hug the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for great PhD.